So I originally worked on season one of Wren as a production design assistant and seamstress in the costume department, which is a, quite a far cry from directing. And since then I've gone on and directed loads of short films and branded content. Action! But it was still kind of interesting coming back in and taking over from three other directors and coming in at the uh, last block of filming. I don't know, you're all tired, but let's do this. But it was awesome. It was really, really cool. Remember that you can get exclusive merch, short stories, interviews, and so much more by signing up to our Patreon and becoming a marked one. This shoot brought a lot of firsts for me. It was my first time directing an episode of a series, first time working on a custom built set, and first time working with an ensemble cast of this size with loads of extras. Ready for my close up. Five to six. Okay, decent, yeah. Colour was very important for the episode as a whole. It's emotionally and physically the furthest from home she's ever been. So we wanted to support that by using a cooler, darker colour palette of blues and greys with accents of orange and yellow. That was actually a homage to one of my heroes, Guillermo del Toro, and the colour scheme that he often uses because he is the master of showing you something dark and scary and then slowly revealing who the real monsters are. That's very much the case with the market itself and its denizens, because at first glance, everything looks very intimidating and macabre. But actually, the more you think about it, this place is completely free from the law of the Kanaf. So it's probably the freest place in the whole world of Wren, where people can look and act however they wish to, which made for quite an interesting design challenge. I actually got to help a little bit with the set build when they needed an extra set of hands. We'd be set dressing into the early hours and listening to 80s music, so yeah, it was quite a nice little design parties that we had. Rose and Ash and Suzanne and their teams were amazing. Early on in pre-production, I put all of my inspirations together into a mood board to show to the crew. And what was really nice is that at one point during the shoot, we were watching a shot back and it was my favourite shot of the whole thing. Action! And we were watching back this take and it just looked so beautiful. I was so happy, I was like nearly crying with pride and I was like, don't cry, it's all right, hold it together. And they and Neil leaned over my shoulder and he went, this looks just like your mood board. And then I nearly went, that was it. I just <laughs> nearly went, so. Cut! <laughs> my episode introduced a lot of new characters some of which may or may not appear in series three. Greetings. Joran is a street urchin. We wanted to very much avoid the stereotypical Victorian Dickens street urchin, because that's something we've all seen before. So instead we looked at a lot of supernatural characters like the fairies in Carnival Row and Legend. And we also wanted to make sure that Joran had no definable gender. Ultimately, Halo Haynes accepted the role and I was delighted because she is a true chameleon. She might actually be a magical character. And action! With Bibliana, the bookseller, we wanted to suggest that she's been everywhere and seen everything and done it all and had lots of adventures before settling down into the slightly easier business of selling illegal books. And she studied a lot of prophecies. So she's the first character to recognise exactly how important Ren and her powers might be for the future. By the sorrow of Creeping Wood Barrow, girl. In the role of Bibliana, we cast Therese Collins, who is an actor myself and Neil have worked with countless times before. Not only is she an amazing actor with a great screen presence, but she's also so much fun to have on set. The Mark One is escaping. Not on my watch, she isn't. There was just something so special about Latoya. We only get a brief glimpse of Halea Tharkand at the end of the episode, but we wanted to immediately suggest someone with presence and authority. I also love the fact that Tharkand is a woman and a younger one at that. 
because she's the one that strips away the last of Ophon's power. It's almost like she's representing that she is the future of the Kanaf and he's the past and he hates that. So that's a really big moment for Ophon's character. And then, help, somebody help. And yes, and then keep going when we roll. Lovely, thank you very much. That's, that's too hard. I'm gonna need at least half an hour to prepare for this. <laughs> Sorry? Get off the <laughs> bus I'm not giving you. The biggest thing that surprised me about Ren is the fact that the people who looked scariest on screen were actually the biggest sweethearts of them all. For example, Richard, who played Ophon, looked so intimidating on camera, but he was such a gentleman on set and also a massive clown. Good to see you. And Dan looked so intimidating as Screed. He had an incredible look about him, but backstage he was such a sweet person that after his untimely end, we even joked about having Justice for Screed t-shirts made. The fight scene in my episode was a knife fight, which I absolutely love because it's such a raw and intimate form of fighting. It's still exciting for the audience to watch, but it's not about big set pieces. It's just about people at this point and the very real risk of losing one another, which is a perfect choice by the writers at this point in the story. Working with Ronin was brilliant. I directed scenes in the past that involved minor stunts, but nothing on this scale of fight choreography. So I had a lot of questions and he was really patient with me and he wanted to make sure that we were both happy with what was going on screen. Right, can we clear all this area, please? All the way back just for a second. So just, just walk that through slowly. So you come down to the stab. You wait here, yeah? Ronan and I talked a lot about power struggles and switching up the balance of power within the scene. But the most important thing for me was maintaining the connection between Ren and Hunter throughout this scene, showing that the stakes are really high for the characters and their bond at this point in the series. The energy coming towards you is really high, so we need to just match that with a massive struggle. There were no easy days on my episode, and one of the big challenges was the two emotional scenes. The first, where she thinks she's going to lose Hunter, it's the push that Ren needs to try using her powers again, fully in control of them for the first time, and realising that they can be a force for good. Cut there. Actually, very nice. One foot, but uh, one more. The scene where Hunter betrays Ren is just devastating for her because she's already lost so many people in her life. She's only just begun to trust Hunter, and now suddenly it's like she doesn't know him at all. He isn't who he said he was. We workshopped lots of different techniques to bring out the emotion of their performances. Everything from improvisation to musical talismans, even a very mild form of hypnosis at one point. But the biggest asset was just the bond that Alex and Oriana had for each other. By this point, they'd been working together so closely for weeks on end, and they created a real genuine friendship, so they were able to support and encourage each other during these difficult scenes. All season, Ren has been asking, who is the archivist and where is the archivist? So we know that this reveal needed to feel special. He will see you. When I read the script, I immediately pictured Florian. It was almost as though it had been written for him. He really embodied the role and threw so much into it. Action! Finding a castle on an independent budget was always going to be hard, and I'm pretty sure we almost gave up hope at one point. So we were so grateful to Sandon Hall for swooping in and saving the day and being such amazing hosts while we were there. We were a bit sleep deprived by this point and it was officially the last day of filming. It gave the whole thing last day of term vibes. So there were a lot of giggles on set and I'm surprised we got any work done at all, but we ended up getting some gorgeous footage that day. We started filming series three while we were there, which makes me so far the only director to have filmed any of season three, which is obviously a huge honor. When the clapboard got changed to read season three, it felt like such a momentous occasion and everyone was so excited about it. But season three won't come without the support of people like you out there. So please keep supporting Ren so that this series can happen. Mm -hmm.